Hi, I'm Christian Esguera and welcome to this week's episode of our Facts First podcast. Okay, so for today, we're going to talk about the government's vaccination drive because as of July 11, uh, there have been 3.5 million Filipinos who have been fully vaccinated. Now, this number may, might, might seem big, but uh, it represents only 3.2% of the entire population and only 4.5% of the target population of 77.7 million Filipinos who need to be vaccinated to be able to, for us, to achieve herd immunity. Now, we understand the limited supply of vaccines, not just here in the Philippines, but elsewhere in the world. But for today, let's talk about the strategy of the Philippine government in terms of rolling out this limited supply of vaccines coming from abroad. So for today, we're joined by Father Nicanor Ostriaco, is a molecular biologist from the University of Santo Tomas, is also part of the Okta Research Group. So for today, he's going to talk to us about the, um, the strategy that needs to be implemented by the Philippine government to be able to achieve that herd immunity despite a limited number or supply of vaccines for COVID-19. Thank you for joining us, Father uh, Ostriaco. Uh, it's our privilege uh, to have you here on our podcast. Thank you, Christian, and have, thank you for having me on your show, uh, especially to, you know, to have this very important conversation on the exit strategy from COVID-19 that the government is currently undertaking. And my, my hope today is to convince you and to our listeners that the current strategy that focuses on the NCR plus eight is in many ways the most efficient way to allocate the very limited doses of vaccines that we have. And this is not, of course, just uh, a challenge that we are facing in the Philippines, but throughout the, the developing world. Okay, so when you say NCR plus eight, uh, which particular provinces are we talking about, aside from the cities and municipality that are found in, the, in Metro Manila? So basically, you've got the NCR itself, it's 17 LGUs, and then you have selected priority cities in the adjoining provinces. So you have to think about uh, Bulacan and Rizal and Laguna, Cavite and Batangas. And then you count into that um, Metro Cebu and Metro Davao. So that's the plus eight part of the NCR plus eight. And so, and that's really, and that's the current strategy. Uh, it has been the strategy for the last few months. And uh, because of the election, the you know because of the politics of the upcoming election, I know that there is uh, a lot of pressure on the government to change that policy, and and I'm here on your show to try to talk to you about why this current policy is really the most efficient way to go. Okay, let's talk about this policy itself. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, so so, I think the best way for me to do that is I'm going to speak pretty much over the next 10 minutes. Let me just present to you sure, the, sure, science, sure. the science for this strategy. So the best way to do it, you have to understand is in order for us to counteract COVID, we have to understand COVID. And COVID, COVID has its own attack strategy. And um, we need to understand the attack strategy for COVID in the Philippines. So the best way to do this is to look at the dynamics of the pandemic over the last 14 months. And um, when I'm usually talking about this on, on a live show uh, with visuals, I present the pandemic curve. And this is a typical pandemic curve. This is the pandemic curve. So on the vertical axis of the graph, you usually talk about the daily cases. And then the horizontal axis, you're looking at um, the, the date. And, and what your listeners have to understand is that we've had pretty much two major surges. So we went into lockdown at March last year. We all remember that, the ECQ. And then we had a major surge around July and August. And then the most recent surge was the surge that we experienced in the NCR in March and April. Now, if you look at this, what you discover is that each of these surges is actually a camel's double hump. So the surge will begin in the NCR, and then it will release in the NCR and go to the provinces. And this is a pattern that you see uh, even more, more recently now. So a lot of people will ask, what is happening now? Why is the NCR at peace? But we have large surges uh, in the Visayas and in Mindanao. And it's the same pattern, actually. It turns out that the, the pandemic can be described in the following way. It's like 
a dropping a, a drop of ink into a glass of water. And the variants will enter the Philippines. They always enter in the NCR. The government will then impose a lockdown around the NCR for a short period of time. But then once the lockdown is released, uh, the the ink continues to spread across the glass. And this means that it will go, end up going into the provinces. So this is the pattern. It's happened three times already. So the original Wuhan variant, this is what happened uh, last year in March. And if you remember, we went into the lockdown and then there was the Balik Provincia program. Once we started to come out of that, it went into the provinces. Same thing happened with the new B1 variant. It entered the NCR, we had a lockdown, and then it moved to the provinces. And then most recently, we have two variants, Alpha and Beta. They entered in March. Um, they peaked in March and April. We locked down. It was, a, it, was, it was quite tragic in the Philippines, if you remember. Um, and then it started to peak again in the provinces. And right now, we are coming down off that second peak, which is really just the alpha and beta variants spreading from Manila out into the archipelago. So if you want to design an exit strategy, you, uh, and by the way, this is very different from the United States. So in the United States, the virus's attack strategy depends upon the seasons. So it goes up during the winter and it goes down during the summer. But in the Philippines, we don't have that. You notice it is completely variant driven. You need a new variant in order to trigger a surge. So if you want to protect the, the country from future surge, what you have to do is you have to protect the Filipino people against new variants. And in this particular case, we're worried about the Delta variant. And so what we have to do is we have to enforce strict travel quarantines, which is why I completely agree with the government's decision, one, to have very tight quarantines of 10 days with testing on the seventh or eighth day, and most recently the travel ban on countries with very, very hot numbers of Delta variant, because we're trying to prevent that Delta from entering into community transmission. So this is 99.7% effective for that international 10-day quarantine. And what is so striking is Filipinos don't realize is that there are many other countries that have even stricter quarantines, uh, 14 days in a hotel uh, with no chance of getting out. And in Hong Kong, they do it 21 days. And the reason why is they're very, very serious about preventing variants from coming in. And this is 100% effective. So at 14 days, you have base, or 14 days or, or longer, you have 100% effective lockdowns. And um, finally, we have to accelerate the vaccination. So there are studies that show uh, one study from the United States, 687 counties. So it's like a barangay. And what they notice is that the counties that exceeded 30% fully vaccinated were Delta resilient. And what I mean here is that the variant enters, but the variant is able, is, is, is slow because of the vaccination rate. And we need that in the Philippines because if not, our contact tracing capacity, our testing capacity will be quickly overwhelmed. So once you get to Delta resilience, the hope is that our contact tracing capacity will be able to keep it in check. And you can see that this data is pretty good uh, in the United States. So that, that was the first thing. The second thing is we have to protect the NCR to protect the country. And if you remember the pattern, the ink drops in the NCR and then it spreads throughout the provinces. So the idea here is if that we uh, inoculate or vaccinate the NCR, we build a wall around the NCR, then uh, the variants cannot enter the Philippines because they enter through the doorway of the NCR. And this indirectly protects all of the other provinces, all of our countryside, all of our rural areas are protected because a variant cannot travel from India to Bacolod without passing through the NCR. So we build a wall of vaccinations in the NCR, we actually keep the virus out, not just from the capital, from, from the entire country. And so you have to understand that the NCR plus eight strategy that the, that the government is currently trying to implement is wall building. We are building a COVID proof wall around the NCR to prevent entry of future variants, not only into the capital. And I, and I really urge, you know, our listeners from outside the NCR to appreciate 
that if the NCR is protected, they are protected because the NCR is the door. If the door is locked, then the enemy cannot enter the building. So um, there were many possible strategies to emphasize the NCR and the government has chosen the NCR plus eight. And the reason why we had to choose this is because there is a severe global shortage. Ideally, if you are the United States and you have an basically unlimited supply of vaccines, you can equally distribute your vaccines to all the regions of your country. But in our case, with the severe shortage, there had to be a strategy to focus that allocation. And so they're doing it to the NCR plus eight. So uh, to understand now how you build a wall, what does it mean to build a wall? Uh, what that means is to build population protection. It's about building herd immunity. And a lot of people don't realize that it's not a black and white thing. So this is a, an image I'm showing now on the screen, which I would want to show your listeners. But here, what you can see is that uh, in the upper left-hand corner, uh, when you when uh, the red dots represent infected COVID patients, and they are spending time with blue dots, those are unvaccinated people. And you can see the red dots e easily find the blue dots. But as the number of vaccinations increase, the yellow dots appear, and the yellow dots prevent the spread of the of the virus to the vulnerable blue because an infected person, a red dot, is surrounded by yellow dots. So there's a continuous increase. As the vaccination increase, the pandemic decreases. But what we know is there are three heights of the wall. You can think of it, three thresholds to protect the population. At 30% of fully vaccinated, uh, the population begins to be resilient against the Delta variant. 40% to 50%, this is containment. And what containment means here is it's very hard to surge. So you can have you can have outbreaks. You will have people getting sick, but you're not going to have the explosive surges that we experienced in March. And then herd immunity is 70 to 80 percent. And basically, at what, when the wall is that high, when you have 70 percent to 80 percent, the virus uh, dies within the population and so and it and new viruses can't enter because there's a there's a wall uh if if an infected ofw landed in the ncr and the ncr was herd immune what would happen is that that person after 14 days he would be healed of his virus and the virus would have had no chance of infecting any other filipino because it's herd immune so it's completely blocked at the door now, uh, this is really important to emphasize because we are trying to build this wall against the Delta variant. We're trying to build it as fast as possible. We are really the only country left in, in ASEAN that is not dealing with community transmission of the Delta. And that's a great blessing, actually. You know, last night I was looking at Thailand and Malaysia and Indonesia and Myanmar and Vietnam. Uh, all of these countries are experiencing explosive surges from the Delta variant. Now, a lot of uh, people have asked me, and I'm sure you, a lot of your listeners are wondering, uh, why, why don't we just give vaccines to all the provinces that are currently suffering from a pandemic surge? And I think uh, it, it's intuitive, you know, it's intuitive because a lot of people believe that vaccines are like the bullets that you use to shoot the virus. But I, but I want to change that image. The vaccines are actually like a shield against future surges. You cannot use it to end a current surge because vaccines are too slow. It takes six weeks or more for vaccines to impact the pandemic. So if you are going through a surge now and, and there are communities in, Vis in the Visayas and in Mindanao who are either in the middle of a surge or just coming off a surge, if they started being vaccinated today, you would not see an effect for two months. And at that point, you would hope that, that the surge is completely mitigated, the, the, the surge is completely uh, settled, which is why um, scientifically vaccines are used to prevent future surges, not current surges. And so what we're doing, the what we're doing now is we're building this wall around the NCR plus eight 
precisely to prevent a future Delta surge. It's not to deal with the current surge. So what is the current status in the NCR? So right now, this week, you can see, um, and this is going to rapidly increase with second doses being administered this week. The first dose in the NCR is about 28%. And first doses in the LGUs of the NCR range from 20% to about 70%, depending upon the LGU. But you see first doses will translate hopefully into second doses within a month. This means given these numbers, right? A 30% is our first threshold. The NCR is expected to, to attain Delta resilience by the end of August. So what does this mean? If we continue vaccinating at this rate, and we prevent the Delta from entering until August, it will struggle to enter the Philippines in September. And that's the hope, right? We're, so that's the hope. We are trying right now to build this wall. And so hopefully it will be high enough by the end of August to fend off the Delta if the Delta enters. And like I said, more likely than not, based on history, the Delta will enter the NCR. Um, so herd immunity will end the pandemic 70 to 80%. And one of the things that I emphasize is that we have to build herd immunity at every level of society. Every family must be herd immune. So when I talk to families, you know, they say, oh, oh, Father, how, uh, what is my goal? I say, your goal is to build herd immunity in your family, in your household. Every business has to be herd immune. Every parish, every barangay, every small institution has to target herd immunity. So we will build herd immunity from the ground up. And uh, the private sector has called this micro herd immunity, this notion that we will build it from the ground up. And you can see this in Mandaloyong this past week, they're putting stickers on households and businesses where all the qualified adults have been vaccinated. And again, this is the idea that we're going to build herd immunity in our houses. And one of, one of the things I've heard is that uh, this has generated vaccine envy. So the neighbors want the same sticker. And so they want to get vaccinated, which is the purpose for all of this. Now, a lot of people have talked about uh, safe spaces. And so they're wondering why uh, we are going to separate vaccinated from unvaccinated Filipinos. And I know a lot of people have been talking about, well, you're discriminating against the unvaccinated by providing perks for the vaccinated. And I think it's really important to understand that we are actually distinguishing vaccinated and unvaccinated because we have to protect the unvaccinated Filipinos from the vaccinated Filipinos. Because we do not know yet for some of the vaccines that have been deployed in the Philippines, whether or not these vaccines, even though they protect you from infection, they may not protect you or prevent you from being a carrier, from transmitting it. So we actually have to separate the Filipinos who are vaccinated and unvaccinated to protect them. And I point this out that we already do this in hospitals, right? So if, you're, if you enter a hospital and you have a cold, the, host, the doctors and nurses are not going to allow you to enter the ICU. And that's not discriminating against you. That is just protecting the patients from getting sick. And the hope is that this will only last until we get herd immunity. And once we get herd immunity, there is no need to discriminate because so many Filipinos have been vaccinated that the virus dies. So when will there be enough doses for the NCR plus eight? Uh, based on the published schedule of the Philippine government, September and October, we will have all the vaccines necessary to attain herd immunity in the NCR plus eight. And how long will it take? So at a rate of 259,000 doses per day, which is actually attainable right now, um, the models predict that the NCR plus eight, the wall uh, will be partially built by August, 2021. That will be Delta Resilience. Containment, October 2021, and herd immunity by November of 2021. So when a lot of people are worried about herd immunity in the country uh, being years away, one of the things that I'd like to highlight is that 
herd immunity in the NCR plus eight is months away. And because of that tax strategy of the virus, once we build this wall around the NCR plus eight, the rest of the country will be indirectly protected because the variants cannot enter. So if we attain containment, this would be October, this is the hope, October, then we can begin to relax the minimum health standards if the Delta does not arrive. So this would allow us, uh, as it was done elsewhere in the world, if you are vaccinated, you could remove your mask. If you are vaccinated, uh, you can start to shorten social distancing, no crowd limits, no testing if vaccinated for containment. And if we attain herd immunity, by definition, this would mean no mass, no social distancing, no crowd limits, no testing, no quarantine. Of course, this is the, this is the goal. This is the ideal for every country in the world. And I point out that we should imagine a no mass Christmas. This is the target, at least for the NCR plus eight. Um, this is the goal. Now, what happens after Christmas, right? So, and um, so currently the government strategy is NCR plus eight plus 10. And the plus 10 is supposed to talk about what happens after Christmas. Because remember, the strategy here is once we have vaccinated and built a wall around the NCR plus eight, we now must begin to build walls around the next hottest spots in the country because you want to vaccinate the next level to protect the downstream uh, countryside. And so these are the 10 cities that the government has uh, identified, Bacolod, Iloilo, Cagayan de Oro, Baguio, Gensan, Zamboanga City, Tugigarao, Dumaguete, Naga City, and Legazpi City. So these would be the plus 10. And it depends on the available vaccine supply. We could extend the plus 10 to plus 12, uh, depending again upon what we will we receive. Now, the idea here is that the NCR plus eight, the target would be Christmas, and the NCR plus eight plus 10 would be Easter. So these are very, very uh, uh, obtainable, attainable targets. Now, again, though, I would like to emphasize that because of the Delta threat, we have to keep our focus on the NCR plus eight. We must build that wall because that is the door. So if we spread it out now, this is the challenge. If we spread it out now, no one will be herd immune. So everyone will be uh, susceptible to the entry of the variant. So if we sacrifice in the rural areas, in the provinces, in order to build the wall around the NCR plus eight, what we're doing is a one country strategy that focuses on one region of the country. So what about the rest? Now, again, I point out that people are not usually thinking about the Philippines this way, but it's really two populations, 55 million in the cities and 57 million in the countryside. And the NCR plus eight will actually protect the 57 million in the countryside, even if they're not vaccinated. So when, again, we tend to think of vaccinating herd immunity for the entire country, but if the NCR plus eight plus 10 is herd immune, the 57 million which are, who are not yet vaccinated will be protected because um, the virus must pass through the cities to enter the countryside. So uh, you cannot get an explosion of COVID-19 in rural Iloilo unless the virus passes through the NCR and probably uh, Iloilo City before entering the, those rural areas. So if we have, we have walls around Manila and then wall, a wall around Iloilo City, the chance of that virus entering the rural areas, even though no one is vaccinated there, or at least, and this is, I think I have to point out, the NCR plus eight plus 10 strategy still prioritizes the most vulnerable. So alongside this focus prioritization, we still have a countrywide uh, outreach to A1, A2, and A3. So all of the healthcare workers will be vaccinated no matter where they live. All senior citizens will be vaccinated no matter where they live. And all adults with comorbidities will be, because we will protect the most vulnerable. It's the, it's, it's the other Filipinos. Uh, even though they're not vaccinated, they will be protected because a COVID-proof wall, COVID wall around the cities 
is a wall around our entire country. And so our immediate goal is actually cities-wide herd immunity. We don't really talk about that. A lot of people talk about the entire country, but you can see based on the strategy and based on the way that the virus moves, if our cities and our highly, highly urbanized areas are herd immune, uh, the entire country is protected indirectly. And this is the goal of the government. Um, because even without countrywide herd immunity, many regions of our beloved country will be back to the old normal. This is the target. Um, and then, of course, the economic machinery of our country will be restored because the cities provide significant amount numbers of consumers. So again, uh, with the economy, the economy can be restored even though half of the country is still, in a sense, in principle vulnerable because they've not been vaccinated, but in reality are protected because of the strategy. So this is our hope and our prayer. I hope we can do this together. So that's it, Christian. That was my spiel. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt you because that was very interesting, Father. But I have a few questions. Yeah, Number one, yeah. How... In the first place, is this strategy, is this proposal of yours already implemented by the national government? And is this being strictly implemented? So, you know, I've been privileged to um, attend the daily briefings of the National Vaccine Operations Center at 8 o'clock every morning. And yes, so the government is implementing this NCR plus 8 strategy at the moment. But I'm also aware that because of the uh, political climate because of the upcoming elections, the government is under enormous pressure to shift away from this policy and to, uh, to, to replace it with what is called a gunshot approach. So we will simply send vaccines to um, numerous highly urbanized areas around the Philippines without this focused, without an, without an explanation for why this shotgun approach would be better at protecting all the Filipinos as compared to the approach that is the NCR plus eight first. So, um, you know, and, 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 and even this morning, it, it's, it's wonderful to see that despite the shortage of vaccines there, you know, the LGUs in the NCR plus eight are, um, have been, are much more efficient now than they were even two weeks ago because the because of this focus priority because target numbers are given for daily jobs uh, many of our LGUs in the prioritized areas are becoming really efficient at uh, vaccinating their people our people okay so so in a way this shotgun approach is already happening but how serious is it and uh is it actually compromising this so, strategy? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good idea. So, you know, um, the shotgun approach can be done at some level, right? So even protecting our senior citizens, protecting our uh, frontliners, protecting our vulnerable adults with comorbidities, that is shotgun. We are, we are, we are vaccinating the, the top three risky categories all over the country, focusing on the cities. But the danger now is that the reallocation to the shotgun approach will actually undermine the NCR plus eight, because what will happen is there are not enough vaccines to build the wall. So you can think about the, the vaccines as the bricks in the wall. So we can either have uh, very low walls or incomplete walls around every province in the country, or we can focus on building a really high COVID proof wall around the most urban, most risky and entry points for the virus into our country. And that's really what the government is uh, it, you know, that, that's the decision that has to be made right now. And I know that the decision was made uh, to focus on building these walls around the three highly urbanized areas. But I'm also aware of the reality that uh, there is significant pressure to shut down. And I'm on your show to try to convince you and to convince our Kababayans that um, the NCR plus eight strategy is simply the most efficient scientifically rigorous approach that we have given the limited number of vaccines. I mean, the tar we are expecting only about 120 million vaccines by the end of this year. Uh, uh, with that number, it will be very hard to get herd immunity 
for if we had a shotgun approach uh, for for any major region for many many months. Okay, because uh, basically this is something that our politicians, our policymakers, need to strictly understand. Earlier you mentioned the the, the political climate, at uh, the upcoming elections. We also understand the need for certain politicians to to show something to their constituents, right? That's but correct. It, it, you have to listen to the science. But uh, have you had any opportunity, for instance, to speak with certain local governments uh, who were actually vocal about this uh, shotgun approach? Uh, well, I personally have not. I know that, uh, uh, you know, we have, we have spoken to politicians overall, but not particular LGUs that are critical. I mean, what, what I would tell these mayors of these LGUs is the following. Uh, we understand your frustration and desperation because the apparent allocation and prioritization to the NCR plus eight at first glance seems unfair, especially if you are going through a surge right now and the NCR plus eight is calm. I can understand that completely. And your people are looking at the news and they're seeing that the, the DOH has declared the NCR low risk. Why are we emphasizing vaccines to the NCR plus eight? And, and, and this is where I have to, you know, appeal to our deep sense of, 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 a, of a people uh, to understand that we are building a wall around the doors to our country. And so um, we are asking our people to sacrifice in the short term in order to realize the benefits of a healthy country in the long term. And because if we, if we do the shotgun approach, we will be vulnerable to surges and variants and attacks for another two years. But if we do the, this approach, the NCR plus eight, then the hope is that by the end of this year, because our walls are built high enough to prevent the entry of variants, that the country will be relatively at peace and that we will not have to worry about surges and lockdowns anymore. Okay. How about, Father, we understand that the vaccines that are currently available, they have different levels of efficacy, right? Uh, we heard some experts uh, mention before that uh, given the varying efficacies of the, of the vaccines available, we might need to adjust our targets to be able to uh, hit herd immunity. What do you think? You're, 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 you're correct, Christian. I mean, all these numbers are hypothetical numbers. Uh, we will target these numbers, and then we actually have to see whether or not uh, the pandemic slows in the way we predict. So there are two. There are two number. There are two variables here. So you've mentioned that there is a uh, mix, and there, there are so many different brands with different efficacies. But on the other side, we have different variants with different transmissibilities, and it's that combination of two sides of unknowns such that we really don't know what is the, the tipping point, the magic number that will end the pandemic. We know it's around 70 to 80%, which is why we have to build the wall as high as possible. Uh, and only once the wall is built, do we know whether or not it works? And if it's not working as well, we have to build it higher. But all the hypothetical calculations suggest that a wall that is 70% protection to 80% protection should be enough, should be enough, but we will see. Okay, but in the meantime, while we're, while we're still building this wall around NCR+, Plus, we have to keep the minimum health standards, right? In so fact, yes. So until the wall is high enough to prevent the entry of new virus, within these... Uh, areas while we're building the wall, you still have to maintain minimum health standards. We still have to wear masks and face shields, and we have to be cautious. We have to be cautious. But again, you know, the, the, the idea is once the wall is built and the enemy is uh, prevented from entering, we can begin to relax all of those. Okay. Father, I'm curious about your engagement with the government because you are a priest. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I won't put you on the spot. But I'm just curious about your the, your situation as a man of science, the other hat that you're wearing, because we you always see this in disaster movies. 
there's always a scientist and there's always this politician. And when, even if there's an impending disaster, the politicians do not necessarily listen consistently to the science. But in this case, in your dealings with the national government, uh, do you get a sense that they are really listening to the science or that political pressure is much uh, is stronger compared to what science is? So I think uh, to answer, I think uh, it depends on whom you're talking to in the government. You know, I, I, I have spoken to uh, politicians in the national government as well as in LGUs at the local government who are incredibly uh, keen on data and who will follow the science wherever it leads. And it's not just science. You provide them with reasons for action. And they see that these reasons are the most efficient way to get to where they want. Because every politician I've spoken to has a, especially about this pandemic, has a deep concern for his or her constituents. So now, of course, they're also thinking about their survival as politicians, especially as the, as the um, elections approach. And so you are seeing, you are seeing politicians uh, exerting enormous pressure. So there was talk this week of the NCR plus eight plus 25. So now there's the 25. This is the shotgun, right? So it's gone from 10 to 25. Um, now, uh, and I was asked uh, by, by one of my colleagues on Okta, you know, which 25? And I said, well, it's the most politically influential mayors. So what you see, what you, what you begin to see is that there is still science because there's NCR plus eight, but there's a, there's a dilution. There's a dilution. Uh, and I, I do not want to claim that this is all politics. I don't think because many of these mayors are struggling with surges today. And so they do not appreciate, I think, the science of the vaccines. And so they believe that the vaccines are like a magic pill that they can uh, obtain that will end the surge and their suffering of their people now. And I'm grateful that they are concerned about their people. It's just that um, they don't appreciate, I think, that it takes longer uh, than they need or that they can tolerate. And so the best way to deal with the surge is with really with minimum health standards. And when you're dealing with alpha, beta variants, really lockdowns. Okay, but how about the IATF and ultimately President Duterte? Because we know, we get the sense of how the IATF makes its decisions. And so it's up to I, the I have not presented this to the IATF, but I presented it to uh, many politicians who are part of the IATF and who have decision-making capacity. And I think that, uh, you know, for, for, the, for those public servants, they, they understand and appreciate the science behind it. Uh, again, though, they are politicians, and so they're coming up with the reality of what is possible in an election season. And this is why I am speaking now to uh, not necessarily the politicians of the national government, but I would like to address our Kababayans who are mayors of the local governments outside the NCR plus eight to try to help them to understand. And not only that, to, to, to ask them to explain to their constituents why the NCR plus eight is not just preferentially uh, singling, uh, singling out the elites because the, the, the perception is that the NCR plus eight, from what I understand, is just an ongoing historical uh, pref privileging of the elites of Manila. And the I think- of Manila. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so this is the Manila elites. And I, what I'm hoping to, to share with you and to share with your listeners is that um, that is the perception and that has been the case for a long time now. I know that from talking to my friends out in Mindanao and Visayas. But what I want to point out is that there is actually science that shows that this, regardless of the historical perceptions, this is really the most efficient way to go. But for the record, just to mm -hmm. clarify things, Father, this strategy is already adopted and being implemented. It has been in place for the last month and a half. Okay. Uh, it's just that there's a, there's a pressure now to change it. And this is why uh, my, my, my role here is to try to, to just show, give you reasons for why this strategy is really 
uh, the mo- the best one we have right now, given the extreme shortage of vaccines that we are facing. Basically, the talk the talk says to some of our politicians and their constituents, right? Anyway, yeah. as a final point, Father, I'd like you to take this opportunity to explain to our viewers and listeners the urgency of this strategy, and number two, why we all need to prepare for the Delta variant. So, um, how dangerous really is it? So, yesterday I was reading news from Indonesia. So, Indonesia is now considered uh, the hot spot the, uh, for not only Asia, but there is now hints that Indonesia has replaced India as um, the central the most dramatic explosion of COVID-19 cases in the world at the moment. Sabah is only 30 kilometers from the Philippines. Just to give you in the province of Tawi-Tawi, it is only 30 kilometers away. So we have the source of the Delta variant at our doorstep. And what you are seeing in Indonesia now is that there were reports yesterday of family members having to call 52 hospitals looking for a emergency room bed for a stricken mother. She was only allowed to enter the hospital. They found a private hospital many kilometers away from their home as long as she brought her own oxygen tank. So... She bought, the family bought an oxygen tank and she entered the emergency room of this remote private hospital with her own oxygen. The Philippines this morning has announced that we are sending our oxygen supply to Indonesia because they are struggling with oxygen. This is the Delta variant. So the Delta variant, uh, there are two reasons why this is so tragic. One is that the Delta variant is about three times more transmissible than the original strain, the original virus a year, 14 months ago. So 14 months ago, when we went into lockdown, if one member of a family got positive, maybe one or two other family members would get sick. But today with the Delta variant, what we're hearing from around the world is that if one member of the family get sick, every person on that household will be expected to get sick within three days, number one. Number two, uh, the variant is also um, more, it's more, it's stronger. So uh, twice as many people with the Delta variant have to go to the hospital. So not only is it more transmissible, which means that more Filipinos would get sick, twice as many as what happened in March would have to go to the hospital. If you remember from the NCR, uh, in March, we had waiting lists at at our hospitals for two weeks. Uh, What will happen is if the Delta variant enters the NCR and our wall is not high enough, we will have a recapitulation of that disaster, but twice as, again, twice as, uh, as horrendous because now you'll have twice as num- twice the number of people getting sick and twice the number of people who, are, who have to go to the hospitals, um, which is why the, the urgency of building that wall around the NCR and doing so protecting the rest of the country is so important. A grim warning indeed from uh, Father Nick uh, Ostriaco, unless we really stick to the science and to what needs to be done. Well, thank you very much, Father, for sharing those data and uh, giving those warnings to all of our viewers and listeners. It's been a pleasure, Father. Thank you for joining us on this podcast. You're welcome, Christian. God bless you. Thank you, Father. So that's it for this week's episode of our Fast First podcast. This has been your host, Christian Esguera. You can catch this podcast on YouTube. Uh, You can also listen to this on Spotify, uh, uh, Google, Apple, as well, and whatever you get your podcast. Thank you very much for joining us. And see you again next week.